Germany embraces open source clouds and KDE makes progress. We're shown how to top NVIDIA and ZDNet tells us about popular distros. Rebound helps you cheat at programming. That's a good thing. In 1804, that's right, the Humbuntu's is right around the corner. And take a look at that business. But before that, we need to say it's another great day for Linux, everyone. So let's go. And welcome back to Linux Weekly Daily Wednesdays. To yeah, that's right. Hello. Time to sit back, relax, mm -hmm. and talk about just some of the neat things that we found. I don't know why I'm doing my NPR voice already. Uh, I usually save that for the end of the show, but you know me, I, I'm old man Ben, <laughs> switching the bits, doing all that, and joined every week, that is uh, L.A. Jill. What's up, Jill? Yeah. Hello, everyone and in podcast land. <laughs> you know it's a Linux Gamecast production because we try to separate <laughs> the time zones as much as possible because that is one Pedro Mateus joining us Hello. from Britannia. <laughs> Oh. GMT all the way, baby. GMT. Fortunately, I'm good at doing GMT or UTC. <laughs> Same difference, different names. Uh, what's been going on, Jill? Do anything exciting happen since last week, man? Well, um, as I said last week, the Linux chicks were getting ready to do a meetup, um, teaching people how to install a web server with LAMP. Mm -hmm. And what was really nice is that DigitalOcean has donated six months free to each of our students, so we can spin up a droplet nice. on on yeah. So that that was really awesome. <laughs> right on, Pedro. Exciting <laughs> stuff. Uh, not really. I mean, there not much happened over the past week. It's just been uh, weird UK weather, which I guess I should be used to it by now. I've been here for what ten months mm -hmm. almost. So, yeah. <laughs> Deportation paperwork takes time. Oh. Um, <laughs> I haven't, uh, not a whole lot. I've been talking back and forth with Feral, trying to get the uh, Tomb Raider up and running. And, uh, yeah, I'll keep everyone updated, but I have some progress to report on that. It's uh, not looking good right now. But I'm glad it's working for a lot of people. Pedro, you didn't have any issues with it. No. It just worked fine out of the box. So, and for Jill, uh, it's working on your AMD card, but not your NVIDIA card. Yes. <laughs> and it's an old AMD card at that. <laughs> hey man, no big issues. Uh, let's just get right into this because um, Deutschland, the government has gone open source with uh, Nextcloud. So that makes sense. Oh, yes. Else. Yeah, so uh, you may have heard of Nextcloud. They're the fork of own cloud from all the way back when. And, uh, well, the I'm guessing the, uh, the German government just went, oh, uh, Munich is going back to Windows, but there was something about that open source thing that we should try out. So uh, let's start using Nextcloud. And, yeah, here they are. Well, it's still a first... Um, first effort kind of thing. There's not a whole lot of users using it right now. But uh, right now they are counting about 300,000 in the ministries. So that's significant. Just have people at work uh, using open source technologies, which is great. More governments should be doing that, Portugal. Uh, but uh, no, it's, it's, it's good to see. Even though Munich was like the shining example of Linux for a while there, and then, oh, no, we're going back to Windows. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, great. At least now, at least Microsoft won't be running on the back end like they are the front end in Germany. <laughs> and they will be using a proper uh, LAMP Next cloud server. So mm -hmm. that's, that's really awesome. Um, and um, at least, you know, they are making the open source transition, but, you know, going from, from back end to forward. So... It's, they tried forward and it didn't work <laughs> for them, but it should have. <laughs> it's pretty wild. This is a I good mean, yeah, they've been doing a pilot program with this business for like roughly 5,000 users since October of 2016. So this has been in the works. Yeah. This is a thing. And yeah, their whole focus was just a bit of privacy. They're like, we run the entire thing, you know. That's completely understandable, but they do make a point that GDPR, if you don't know what that is, if you're in the States, look it up. This is going to be completely compliant with that. And I'd say neat. Open source technology gets 
expletive deleted done can't use that word yeah. on <laughs> all right a yeah. uh, little yeah. bit of sad news up next uh is uh the chip you know it you love it you might have heard of it uh, hopefully you've heard of it it was the nine dollar computer that like six people were able to get and everyone bought one it yeah. was a neat piece of kit while well, everyone tried to order one and I couldn't find any news about this. Honestly, I think it was Mir that sent over the information because Mir managed to get one. He did a little video on it. It's uh, on our YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. But if you try to order it, you go to the store right now and it's just like, it's gone. You yep. get an error on the page. Because apparently the chip, chip pro and all chip related uh, devices are no more. They're gone. Deceased. It's kind of sad. Yeah. It's really, really sad. My um, my husband was trying to get me a chip and a pocket chip um, and has been following this for over a year. Mm -hmm. um, he tr And actually, uh, uh, two years ago, he, he um, they were on back order. And then um, he tried to get one for me for my birthday and noticed that there were a lot of angry posts on the forums of of the orders not coming through and people you know paying for them and not getting them. And mm -hmm. I really wanted several of them for my collection but i'm very happy that he didn't pre-order one and we and we didn't lose money so that would have been a thing but i really yeah. do want one for my collection so i'm going to be trolling ebay <laughs> <So>. <laughs> there's bound to be one showing up there soon enough probably yeah. at a, like a 300 or 500 percent markup but it's <laughs> it's uh it was an interesting concept to chip it's pack as much horsepower as you can into a teeny tiny little soc and it would have worked were the uh raspberry pi compute module not a thing because when you have something that just oh it fits into a regular so dim ddr3 and it just gives you a whole computer from that one relatively standard interface Huh, yeah. Mm. I'm definitely in the boat of, I, I think all the Kickstarter backers ended up getting him one. Um, mm -hmm. I never tried to order one. It would, it fell in the category as if I just end up with one, I might play with it. But it just didn't have enough horsepower to do anything for me that would be useful other than just the neat factor. And I was always curious. I know Pedro will back me up on this. Uh, I know for well over a year, I was like, I don't know if they're able to actually produce mm -hmm. this thing for nine dollars now hear me out because he was like well i can open up a mauser electronics and source this stuff for roughly that price true but not when you factor in r d and packaging shipping yeah. and everything else involved yeah so i don't know it might explain that initial run and just kind of poof i don't know i want more information if you know anything yeah. send us some metro because i just can't find yeah. any anything on this in the news or no one's paying attention so and that's the big one here it's like okay so they're gone that's you know it sucks but yeah you know tech companies come and go just let us know what happened mm. that would be nice because yeah. literally the last blog post was from uh november 2017 what happened we want to know. We want to make a reality to No, we don't. Um, <laughs> Plasma Valen for 513. And the future is here, Pedro. Oh, yes. The future is here. Uh, it's, uh, it's progress. I wouldn't say the future is here, but it, it, it's progress. So uh, in February, Plasma 512 was released. And, well, they wanted to improve Valen support. And with um, 513, they are trying their best to accomplish that. And the first step was make sure that the QT, QPA platform environment variable did not default to Wayland. Because <laughs> even though there are quite a few um, QT applications out there that do support Wayland, there are a few which have a very wide uh, user base, like Telegram. Uh, they do not support Wayland. And with that particular environment variable set to Wayland by default, Stuff like Telegram just wouldn't start. There was also the issue of screen recorders because of the way that the the way that Wayland uh, does the 
you know, the GUI server, it's mostly based on the compositor. So it doesn't work like X the same way, you know, that you would be using like OBS or simple screen recorder or anything else for that matter. Uh, in Wayland, everything runs off the compositor. The compositor is a display server. So they had to find a way to make sure that those applications would support Wayland without them having to actually go in and support Wayland. So what they came up with was a little interposer library uh, they called the XDG Desktop Portal. It's not a library, it's more like an entire subsystem in itself, which if you've used Flatpaks and you've been developing for Flatpaks, yes? Well, I think the big story here that um, kind of puts a smile on my face is they're using Pipewire. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, Pipewire. Yes, they are. <laughs> uh, uh, XDG, Desktop Portal, and Pipewire is what they're using if you want to do some uh, desktop recording. And uh, XDG, Desktop Portal is what flat packs use. Uh, so if you've been a flat packager, you probably know about it. Uh, it's it's good to have like a neutral uh, base to targets like, okay, so we're targeting that, that's supported by flat packs, you know, universal package and all that. So every single distro should be able to support it if they want to. And that's all that the developers of those screen recorder apps have to support. Hmm. So it will be nice to see whether or not OBS will support that in time, but it's uh, it's progress, progress on the Wayland for KDE. Yeah. So all of this cool stuff comes yeah. with the uh, downside of having to use KDE? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it does it is some cool stuff uh we already yeah. talked about like the per display uh scaling let's say you have uh, ladies multiple and gentlemen displays. i was trolling pedro pedro's <laughs> trying to argue with me i'm just having fun um no it's a, that's wicked cool that yeah pipe wire pipe wire, all that fun stuff uh the fedora camp's working on is it's like hmm because one of the things i'm definitely <clears throat> paying attention to is video production and tool chains under Linux. So I'm, I'm okay. You have my attention. Waylon, we're going to be talking about that a bit later. Jill, do you have any thoughts on this one? Oh, um, I'm just, it's just nice that there's um, another distro that's heavily testing Wayland because we need it to work. <laughs> we yeah. really do. Well, it, it's <laughs> definitely got to work, but didn't yeah again no we're going to be talking about a distribution it's like oh they kind of tapped the brakes on the wayland thing and we, we need to swap yeah. that back out you exactly. kind of can't completely blame them on that uh what do we have coming up next as i realize yeah. i have show notes out of order nvidia top yeah it's a td tidy open source tool that uh that's his name uh uh, person. Yeah, I'm not even going Abish? to try. <laughs> Abish yeah, I, 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 <laughs> yes. <laughs> I butchered that name, but yeah. It's NVIDIA Top. It's, uh, it's available on GitHub. It runs on Python. It runs on um, uh, NCurses. It uses NCurses to do the little uh, terminal user interface, mm -hmm. which there's not much interfacing with it. It's just It just gives you like a top style um, output of what applications are currently using your GPU and the amount of RAM that they're using and a couple other stuff. And he says that he is very much looking for input on what to show when you run NVIDIA Top. And I did run NVIDIA Top because you could just download the, the file or just copy over the source code to a blank file and uh, make it executable. It, as long as you have Python 3 and NCURSES mm -hmm. installed, it should just run. And it's uh, it was interesting to see X take over 200 megabytes of RAM to just, you know, work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, I'm, I, I think it's actually really, really awesome. And it's really, really useful for me um, uh, um, for, for doing animation and rendering because I've, mm -hmm. I've used the, their um, NVIDIA SMI tool quite frequently, actu actually. Mm -hmm. So it's wonderful for watching CUDA GPU renders with the Blender Cycles render. And mm -hmm. um, I set up a CUDA GPU animation render in Blender 2.79 to track memory usage in NVIDIA Top, which like Top or HTOP track stats continuously. And compared the results, of course, to the NVIDIA SMI utility, which tracks stats statistically, uh, statically. 
um, mm -hmm. and has to be launched every time you want to monitor the GPU, which is really a pain. And um, I put together a screenshot showing um, the memory uh, of the, the two applications running next to each other. So you can see that, that when you run um, NVIDIA top, the, um, the memory you know, changes over time, whereas the NVIDIA SMI, the memory, of course, stays the same from when you launched it. And I also noticed the memory usage of X, like Pedro did. And I'm mm -hmm. running, I was running the lightweight Flexbox window manager. What the heck is it using 200 me over 200 megs to run X for? It's you know? X. Hey, hey, hey. It's <laughs> Jill, man, check it out. Lightweight's not what it used to be. This is 2018, 200 megs. Yes. Like, that's barely a thing. Hmm. I tracked this down. Fortunately, this is one of the very, very rare occasions where I did not end up spending an evening reinventing the wheel because mm -hmm. I was all, all up in the NVIDIA SMI. I was like, I need a visual representation to send to a certain company who made a game that I can't get working and they're saying something's happening <laughs> and it's not. Um, yeah. So I cracked this open and it was able to display what applications were between, because I have a 980 and a 770 in our production box. And it's smart enough to say this is running on this, this is running on this. And it's also very helpful for tracking down if you're just sitting at idle on your desktop. So like, what's using 20% of my primary video card for no reason? Nothing's running. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can hunt those critters <laughs> down, much like with yeah. HTOP or anything like that, and hit them with the low orbit ion cannon. So yeah. good on that <laughs> business. Pedro, you bought a Tegra Shield tablet. Yes, here it is. Here it is. <laughs> Look at that. This is the exploding one. It may explode at any point. Linux Weekly That's Daily Wednesday is yeah. delivering props. <laughs> yes. Man, this is a high production joint, what we have here. Uh, so yeah, it could explode at any point. Uh, but yes, uh, this one is not affected by this particular exploit, because uh, this exploit is only present in SOCs uh, based on the Tegra X1 chip. Uh, that means that the switch, the shield, not this one, not that one, and not that one either. Uh, we're talking about the shield Android TV console thing that runs on the X1 uh, and the Pixel C are all vulnerable to the what do they call it that had a fancy name uh, reswitched they called it re the reswitched yeah because it works on the switch it, it's based on the the X1 um, SOC so you can actually trigger it uh, the exploit it works off of a, a bug with the USB stack and how it interprets the commands that it gets. So you can actually send a malformed command and it will run just the arbitrary code you attach to it. So they got a little uh, proof of concept in the screenshot at the top of the article. It's like, oh yeah, a switch being re-switched. So it's it's an <laughs> issue. And it's a very significant issue, isn't it, Jill? Yeah. Yes, it can't be fixed because, <laughs> because it's, a, it's the result of a hardwired uh, fuse that was burned in, in the, in the uh, manufacturing process, what I like to call a crispy fuse. <laughs> so that's really bad. I mean, it's, it's, uh, you, you can't you know, fix it with software because it's a hardware issue. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, um, for a lot of people, the Nintendo Switch just got wicked useful as a mm -hmm. little tinker device. But they do make a point on the GitHub page that th this is, give, give it maybe another week. But right now, this is not something, you know, grandpa or grandma is going to roll out and set up. This You got to know what you're doing at this point. Yeah. So keep that in mind. Just trying to save everybody a little bit of time. Before they do that, but, but yeah. hey, they managed to find a way to make the Pixel C useful. That's good. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm staying out of that. I'm staying out of that because uh, that's a holy war. So let's talk about something that couldn't possibly lead to uh, no. Talk about idea. holy wars. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, the most. This is coming from ZDNet. We like to throw these in every now and then because I am on a mission to stop their page from seizing as it tries to <laughs> auto load video. It's kind of hard mode. What is the most popular Linux distribution of them all? Um, 
If you kind of go through the numbers, they're using DistroWatch, so that's an R in, a bit of an RNG, and even DistroWatch mm-hmm. is like, yeah, it kind of is, it's a popularity contest. Uh, it shows that Mint has been dethroned by an infinitely more user-friendly distro, uh, Manjaro. Uh, <laughs> you might know that. They kind of look at the Google Trends and just kind of speculate. So by this author's reckoning, uh, for end users like Android, and I know somebody's out there, Android, not Linux, yeah, okay, whatever yeah. lets you sleep. <laughs> followed by Chrome OS, oh, not, not Linux either, come on. <laughs> uh, yeah, but followed by you know Debian, Kubuntu, and all the Mint variants and all that. Uh, Arch and Manjaro are making a desktop move. They are. I mm-hmm. mean, that is that is the new hotness. Mint, back in my day, was the new hotness compared to Kubuntu. I was the weirdo. <laughs> Debian <that>. Brown edition. <laughs> right. And, uh, <laughs> Server and Cloud World, uh, Kubuntu followed by CentOS, RHEL, and Celeste. So uh, yeah. that yeah. that last bit, you know, in the enterprise, and that hasn't changed in since forever. So that's like one place where if you walk into a data center and you see like Kubuntu server, you Abe Simpson with your hat and go right back out mm-hmm. the door. But you commonly... We'll see Celeste. Uh, CentOS, not so much, but that's good for uh, testing if you don't want to pay for a gang of licenses. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, mm-hmm. they tried, uh, <laughs> bless them, they tried to get as many stats from as many different sites that they, as they could. Mm-hmm. Uh, Stat Counter <laughs> basically just said, oh yeah, Android is the most popular operating system, period. That means it is beating Windows, <laughs> according to Stat Counter. Uh, yeah. They also tried net market share, which we've talked about because mm-hmm. they were the ones that said that, oh, Linux is hitting 4%. What? What? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, no, as it turns out, according to their um, little research there, net market share can't really tell the difference between Fedora, OpenSUSE, or Ubuntu. So, Not a very good indicator of which distro is the most popular, but if you look at the Google Analytics, yeah, uh, Ubuntu is leading by a significant margin, and it makes sense. I mean, um, we've heard time and time again Canonical saying Ubuntu is the most popular, Linux distro is the most widely adopted, yes. Granted, yeah. (laughs) probably (laughs) no arguments will ever be had there as much as certain... uh, Destro users would like to argue that Arch is the best one. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, truthfully, uh, right now the new hotness is Ike's Solace. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> to, to us diehards, <laughs> it's like it's the new hotness, and everyone's uh, been in, enjoying it and trying it because it's you know independent, and uh, it's mm-hmm. just nice to have another independent. Uh, Linux from scratch distro out there. It's underground, <laughs> man. It comes on cassette tape. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> With a beanie games. and a punching bag. Great, man. <laughs> Those are accessories. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think the more yeah. it, it's, especially with your desktop, it's, I only say this half joke, at least whatever the kids are into. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. It's going to be your leader. And mm-hmm. that's the thing. It's, it's good to see Arch because I, Love Arch and the very simple fact, even if you installed Targos or something like that, which basically just does it for you, you're still going to learn things because things are going to break with a rolling release. Mm-hmm. And that's mm-hmm. a good thing. Uh, but Chrome OS. Chrome OS. Know it. You love it. It's getting a terminal app. Yes. Speaking of popular <laughs> Linux distros, Chrome OS being perhaps the actual distro between Android and Chrome. Chrome is actually just running the Linux kernel. It runs a different graphical uh, server. It's not exactly X. And it is very much a distro. But these bits of news have actually been making the rounds this week, which is, oh, there's uh, some hints of upcoming Linux support in Chrome OS. There's some hints. It's Linux. Yeah. What? <laughs> but it's, it's it's actually been really annoying me because if it was like the other way around, because right now the big thing about Chrome OS is how it is Linux and it runs Android apps. They're still using uh, like an improved version of Arc that they didn't act exactly release to the public. But uh, poking around in my Chromebook, it's like, okay, so how are you running the Android apps? Oh, you're still using Arc. Okay, so that would be nice to see if they actually released Arc to the public and let everyone also run uh, Android apps on their 
whatever this row they happen to be using, but we're not getting that, and we are instead getting a terminal that will let you basically do what what you already get, which Jill brought up in the notes. Jill, what do you yeah. already get? Yeah, um, <laughs> there's already a terminal for the Chromebook in the Chrome browser that you could access mm -hmm. by enabling de developer mode at boot and pres pressing Control-Alt-T. It's what I use to install Crouton with Ubuntu on mm -hmm. my original Samsung 5 Chromebook. And this is back in 2011. And I have it right here. <laughs> yep. That is my I original Chromebook. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's, 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 they're doing it, you know, this, this way, it, it makes it easier for the average user to, to use. But, but still, it wasn't that hard before either. <laughs> To, yeah. To run the terminal. <laughs> well, I mean, if it's out of the box, it's probably a good thing. I, I just kind of look <laughs> yeah. at it because I have given um, Pedro no small amount of grief about getting a Chromebook because it boggles. I, I listen. I hundred percent understand. It's not going to stop me. It's from a toy. It <laughs> I understand it for educational institutions and stuff like that. The power wash feature. It's great and it's indestructible on that. But once you. start start adding things, you know, terminals, the ability to run apps, and you kind of defeat the point of having the Chromebook yeah. in the first place. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I just I just run Ubuntu on mine, and it's has great battery life. So, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it's really good for that. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah that's, no, that's the nice uh, thing about them. It has the great Acer. battery life is like saying, man, it can keep a web browser open for a long time. Uh, yeah. About 10 hours exactly. on my Acer. Yeah, it's pretty good. Um, I wouldn't be compiling a kernel on it, of course. But so <laughs> And mine's an ARM mine's an ARM version. So. Well, yeah. I mean, they, Google has made some big honking like i7 Chromebooks, and that, that just hurts uh, the me. The Pixels. Right. The original yeah. Pixel yeah, Chromebook. Pixel. What? Ooh. What? You want 1200 yeah. bucks for that? <laughs> Oh, mm -hmm. good luck. I mean, I, I look forward to getting that off. Well, you'll probably never get them off eBay because they're collector's items. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those things will appreciate. Uh, let's talk about command line tools that instantly fetch Stack Overflow results when you get a <laughs> compiler error. Um, this absolutely just sucks all the sport out of it, doesn't it? It mm, yep. does what it's it says like, on oh, the tin. I'm trying to build something. Stack Overflow has the answer. Yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> if you do, you can just... You install this. All this business is in our show notes, so don't worry about that. Just head over to linuxemgas.com and take them out. Uh, if you get the error, just punch in rebound. We're looking at this right now. It's an animated GIF, GIF, whatever. It is going to query Stack Overflow. Mm -hmm. and it's like, yo, man, it's got a nice little menu to go through topics and figure out <laughs> what's been voted the most. Uh, you know, very in curses. Set up simple installation, pip install rebound CLI, because that's Python. Yeah, it is. Um, neat. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's cheat mode for <laughs> those people still uh, using the terminal for all their code writing and compiling and whatnot. It's cheat mode, and it's, well, yeah. it's a better <laughs> Visual Studio implementation on Linux than we had with Visual Studio Code. Just saying. Yeah. <laughs> I, just, I just figure if, if you're neck deep into doing any of this, you already have a dedicated Stack Overflow or Stack Exchange monitor set up. Oh, but, yeah. yeah. Huh. I don't know. I just wanted to let everyone know it was out there, and it's Python, so I know Strider will champion it. It'll, it. You know, a year from now, somebody will uncover it. Like, what's this in Lutris for? I don't understand. <laughs> you accidentally copy and paste it in there. <laughs> so the one thing we need to talk about, eager beaver, get your mind out oh, of the gutter. Yes. We're talking about 1804, Jill. <laughs> yes. Tomorrow, April 26th, is the release of Ubuntu 1804.04 LTS Bionic Beaver. And I know what I'm going to be doing tomorrow, installing 1804. Um, uh, uh, Ubuntu um, users who want to upgrade do a district upgrade um ubuntu recommends that you wait a month for to get the notification to do the upgrade but i'm just i'm i'm just gonna do it i've done it before i, I did it when i went from from 1404 to 1604 or so so i think i'm gonna go i'm just just gonna do it i've i've heard um from a lot of people it's actually really stable the beta was actually very stable so um it should be just fine and there's lots of new features in Ubuntu 1804. I know everyone's been hearing about them for the last year. And of course, GNOME 3.28 is the default display manager now, and there's no more Unity. 
and uh, the the speed uh, uh, boot speed has been increased uh, thanks to system D libraries. Um, so it starts up faster. And uh -huh. a new minimal in installation option, which installs the base Ubuntu web browser and utilities is new in 1804 and was also included in, in the latest Ubuntu Mate. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorites is installing PPAs requires one less, less line in terminal now. So when you run add apt repository, apt get update is automatically run. And nice. it includes... <laughs> that, that's awesome. And so when you're doing lots of PPA installs, it'll be a little quicker. <laughs> mm -hmm. And <clears throat> Linux kernel 4.15 will be the default. And what's interesting is they're going back to Xorg as the default display server. Apparently, if, if, like we talked about earlier, there are a lot of applications that didn't work well under Wayland in Ubuntu 17.10. So they're switching the default back to Xorg, but you still have the option of installing Wayland. And yeah. um, the server edition um, installer, it moves from Debian's text base to the Subiquity, uh, subi subiquity <laughs> text UI. <laughs> it's Ubiquity with an S at yeah. the top. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> subiquity <laughs> text UI, which is a little cleaner and nicer looking. And um, as we, we stated in previous ep episodes of LWW, we got easier live patching with the software and updates utility, which is uh, um, you, could, you could do live patching via GUI instead of terminal, as long as you have an Ubuntu One account. Hmm. So there is oh, just a They're whole... still writing that boat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> There's just a whole lot of new wonderful features about 1804, and I'm just excited to be able to be installing a new stable release <laughs> yeah I, i've done um just kind of poking around looking for some of the big gotchas because we're currently yes. on 1710 <laughs> normally i would stick with lts releases like old man pedro has stubbornly mm -hmm. um but i moved to 1710 so this won't be as painful <laughs> to get up and running with 1804 I did yeah. notice I was kind of doing boo boo words because they're going to be shipping with 415. It's like you're really shipping. And I understand why, but I got to say this because it's kind of funny and I want to say it like this. You're shipping with a kernel that just reached end of life. <laughs> yeah, yep. that was interesting. No more active development yeah. on 415. <laughs> mm -hmm. I know it's timing. I, it's I know things need to get <laughs> tested. And trust me, there's stuff with 416 <laughs> that I'm not running 416 right now because of reasons. Uh, <laughs> I dig it. It has a bunch of help things for GNOME, which should include therapy because I was a GNOME earlier. This oh, I don't. <laughs> you, yeah. you you have my respect if you can do it with GNOME and its bounciness and stuff moving around. I was like, leave me alone, desktop manager. I just want to open a terminal. Uh, it's a good piece of kit. I'm gonna try it out uh, much later. So I, I need every one of you to go out there and blindly update it and install it and get all the bugs hammered out. So like two or three months from now, we, we can do the update after the point one release. Yeah. I'm totally yes. going to be one of those people. Uh, because oh. yes, like Ven already mentioned, I'm still running 1604. And uh, yeah. well, it's it's been running okay. It's been running really, really, really well. It's perhaps the, uh, I installed Ubuntu Mate 1604 Basically, when uh, Martin got beat to 1080, appreciate it, Martin. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> and it's been running that particular install since then. Uh, it had an SSD die in the middle of it, but uh, I, I just <laughs> basically took the image from that I had gotten and just restored it. So it's technically still the same install. Uh, and it's been running well enough, but uh, yeah, it's getting a little long in the tooth. So yeah. 1804 is probably going to break in spectacular ways. I'm very much looking forward to it. It's probably going to be the time that I switch to Solus. If only they supported Rays in their <laughs> yes. installer, Aiki. Hey, mm -hmm. but before, before we get done with the news, uh, we need to talk about our new favorite segment, uh, Microsoft Hearts Linux. Yes, uh. yes. <laughs> They say they do, anyway. Visual CC, yeah. uh, Visual CC, yes. New language invented by yours truly. Visual C++ <laughs> team blog announcing a single C++ library manager for Linux, Mac OS, and Windows VC package. Yes, we've won. 
as Linus once said, once Microsoft starts making Linux programs, we've won. And yes, mm-hmm. yes. Joel, They've gone past making programs. Yeah. <laughs> now it's entire library sets. <laughs> uh, Explain this the penguins. Don't tell me about <laughs> oh, it. Oh, okay. Well, um, I, I, you know, is <laughs> my first re- gut reaction was, is anyone really going to be visual plus plus to create programs for Linux other than Microsoft? <laughs> and, um, Yes, I, I I think that is a yes. After I thought about it. it, it'll be it's it's nice that it is cross-platform compatible has cross-platform compatibility with Linux and Mac, mm-hmm. and it has the potential to produce produce many more programs for Linux that were only available on Windows, which is nice. So we we got to think about mm-hmm. that <laughs> that option as well. Um, but there there was all already a as Ven mentioned there was already a compiler. That let you, you know, go over um, to cross-platform Visual C, C plus plus, FIPS. <laughs> yeah, FIPS. And is I've a never thing. used that. Yeah, that was the first thing yeah. I thought of. I was like, wait a minute, FIPS already does this. But you got to understand, Microsoft is doing this because Microsoft's rolling out a bunch of Linux tools, is rolling out its own distributions yes. of Linux, mm-hmm. and these are yes. tools that it's going <laughs> to be using internally. So the one good thing you can say about Redmond is, like, okay, yeah, we had to make this. Um, yeah. You guys can use it to anything that helps and simplifies cross-platform development. I'm for even if it comes from yes. Microsoft. This is this is exactly a usable yeah. tool, unlike <laughs> that Visual Basic whatever they tried to glorify text editor they released. Yeah, Visual Studio Code. Dude, Visual Basic's got a decent debugger in it. No one's going to argue that. But whatever they released on Linux, I don't know what that was. It. Yeah, mm. this one uh, I was kind of on board with this. You know, Microsoft wins because they're unifying yeah. the uh, library stack. It's the one library stack for all the operating systems, so chances are things are just going to work, and it's going to make their life a heck of a lot easier. But then I read this particular sentence from like the very first paragraph of the article. This gives you immediate access to the VCPKG catalog of C plus plus libraries on two new platforms with the exact same simple steps you are familiar with on Windows and the universal Windows platform today. Now, that is my brain went, oh, God, releasing <laughs> universal Windows platform applications on Linux. Yes. Oh, oh no, no, no. God. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably coming. <laughs> something, something, <laughs> Electron. Uh... <laughs> yeah, at least Adobe won't have an excuse now. <laughs> no, no, they're going to revive <laughs> air. Air's back. Yeah, they're going to be. And this time it's out for vengeance. Hey, uh, that's going to do it for the news. We want to thank everyone for making this bus. Before we get into the slice of pie, we definitely want to thank a couple of new mm-hmm. people who joined us on Patreon. Hey, if you're thinking about this nonsense, you're like, hey, I kind of like this. It's pretty cool. Maybe I want to support these yahoos. Head over to linuxgamecast.com, tap the support button. We got the patrons, we got the Amazon links. Thanks for everyone shopping through those, especially the uh, Humble Bundle. And uh, wish list stuffed. Hey, Trugs, Trugs picked us up arts and crafts because he sends in a little note and he picked up our wish so and it was uh, some wallpaper and a shelf that I can't really see yet because I don't have the shot set up for it. But he sent in a little note because you can do that. And mm-hmm. I always like uh, reading these because sometimes they're bad, but I can read this one on the show. Uh, enjoy your gift. Uh, you need to, you need more cheap things on your list. He bought all the cheap stuff on the list. I love you, Trugs. <laughs> You're Yay, awesome. <laughs> Thank you for doing that. But uh, we have a couple of new patrons. We need to thank Pedro. Yes, yeah. we do. Uh, Mr. Frostclaw20, you may have seen him. He's been wait, in wait, Discord wait, wait, already just, chatting wait. up oh, people. Oh, oh, oh. Yes. You, careful, careful. Oh, you, too late. You've summoned, oh. you've summoned the social oh. There he is. The penguin. the penguin making it rain. Yes, Mr. Frostclaw also made it rain on us. Thank you very much. Uh, he now has access to our Discord, which you can also get if you go to Linux Gameca- uh, well, LinuxGameCast.com okay. forward slash support. We'll give you the link, but it's Patreon.com forward slash Linux Gamecast. And uh, Jay Rulio, which was one of our existing Patreons that has increased his pledge. Thank you. Thank you very much. Man, we are jumping up on the... Ooh, now we are... Ooh. Less than twenty dollars <laughs> away from the audio stream. After that, oh, oh no! Yes. See, this this is the uh, Pepsi challenge right there, setting up on <laughs> Alpha side. But you make this business possible. Without you, we'd be reading ads about mattresses and uh, Jello or something. <laughs> but we also do a couple of extra shows. 
Just reload. And uh, Pedro, you're doing a Tuesday show. You played some strafe. You ran around sideways, Betty. Indeed. And I actually did not expect it to go that well, but I didn't die a single time. So eh, mm. <laughs> that went well. <laughs> Tune in tomorrow as Jordan plays question mark. We don't know. It's going to be a thing. And I'll be uh, around Friday for the Friday FUBAR. And sometimes, well, I think sometimes mm. Jill always shows up. So me and Jill play video games. Yeah. <laughs> you just got to deal with it. That, that's what we do now. Sorry, Steve. <laughs> Friday and Saturday yeah. now, buddy. Um, I know. <laughs> that's definitely a thing. Um, thanks again, everyone, for making this uh, possible. This is, this is a fun ride. We, we enjoyed doing mm. this. Uh, that, that's enough of uh, the shilling. Let's get into the slice of pie where we're going to talk about anything that's t- teeny and tiny and electric powered, like uh, a lesson in wireless engineering from the Raspberry Pi. We're talking about antennas, Jill. Yeah, yeah. Um, This actually was an amazing story. It's um, how they use, uh, how they they track the wireless capabilities of of devices, and they they go into an antenna chamber. It's called, and um, it's it it. Allow, it, it doesn't allow wireless signals to go out or in. You call that but... whatever you want. I just want one in my house. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, no. I want one in my house. <laughs> totally. <laughs> but but what the article is about, it actually, is, is a, it's amazing. The Raspberry Pi Zero W and the, the, and the new Raspberry Pi 3B antenna achieves amazing performance for its size, cost of development, mm-hmm. and $10 price tag. It's really, really amazing, and because of this, you know, a lot, a lot of uh, SOCs and embedded devices um, can use the, this tiny antenna and achieve wonderful results. Um, they were um, uh, this test; they were amazed by the results uh, that the the Pi um, achieved. It was really, really um, yeah, amazing because Kept uh, the he starts, yeah. Yeah, he started the article by saying, oh, so hidden antennas and low profile antennas, they're like the biggest enemies of reception. And, you know, if you are creating a hotspot, the way to get the radiation out there and getting the other devices to yeah, radiation. You're holding it wrong, forward. Pedro. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's really hard to get a good signal if you're using a teeny tiny low profile or a hidden antenna and yet with a raspberry yeah. pi zero even though it's right there on the pcb you can see it's got a little arrow shape to it it's yeah. really good and it's really really good and this particular article i was reading through it's like wow this is uh he knows what he's talking about. And then I got to the to the end of the article. Oh, oh, okay. He's an RF engineer with Pedro, s- several pa- years yeah. of Pedro, experience. A- anybody who has that room or access to that room probably knows yeah. what they're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he, uh, he does a lot of um, hardware, uh, RF hardware uh, design and antenna design. So he knows what he's talking about. And if he's saying that the Raspberry Pi Zero antenna is good, Probably should be yeah. paying attention. I've never tried wireless on any of my pies. Uh, I think I have like two metal bees with, I assume it worked. It's always a thing. I just, I'm always around some ethernet doodles. So yeah, plug that in. It's good to know that it does. Uh, did he test the compute module or just? Uh... Uh, the compute module doesn't have a built-in Wi-Fi thing. It's, yeah. uh, it's the Raspberry Pi 3, Pedro, the 3B Pedro, Plus, Pedro, the Zero W. Pedro. Everything has a Wi-Fi if you're brave enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just throw it at something. Look, no wires. <laughs> hey, man, that, that was one bit. Um, I'm doing this old school. Uh, interesting, interesting article. Uh, just to find out, it was like, oh, I learned something accidentally. That's neat. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah. What do we got up next? Audio files. This is, well, well, sh- up next as he hit the wrong button (laughs) silence ladies and gentlemen uh (laughs) raspberry pi dac hat that's right not no you didn't mishear me dac digital audio converter hat has dual 24-bit dacs and 128 decibel signal to noise ratio this is like audio file level stuff ladies and gentlemen uh you can pick up the fully it's currently on kickstarter right now you can just get the board the add-on board by itself uh, for $175. That's a $5 stacking header. 
and uh, 25, it's got a three, well, a three amp power supply and all this business. But if you want the full Monty with a touchpad and everything else, because I mean, you can make this a solid looking piece of kit, $574. That sounds crazy. And to talk to an audiophile who's got like $9,000 headphones and yeah. you're like, woo. <laughs> but they have it in configuration. It's got dual XLR mini jack inputs plus RCA. And this thing is supposedly amazing. I don't know. This is uh, at 500, 500 plus a pie. Mm -hmm. this no, it includes the pie. If you buy the full 500 thing, it includes the pie. Okay. That, that's pretty cool. Uh, that That's completely different than I thought I was going to have to buy that $35 pie paper. So this, this <laughs> changes what I was about to say, my opinion on it completely. This is a must buy. Um, it's too much value. I don't know who this is aimed at because once I start getting to $500, yeah, I can get some other hardware. This just doesn't seem like, oh, I'm going to buy one of those to tinker with. This seems like uh, here's uh, $17 worth of surface mount components. Uh, give us 500 bucks. I think this is one of those niche products. Uh, it's the, um, the audio person that's also into the DIY stuff and they're trying to build a specific device that they need because they want to take it somewhere or because they needed it to fit into a very specific enclosure. And well, this, uh, the moment you slot the hat into the GPIO pins of the Raspberry Pi, it's really not that much taller than say the ethernet port. So it's, it's going to fit that form factor relatively well. So I can see why that would be useful, but uh, at 175 for the base hat, it's on Kickstarter right now. Mm -hmm. uh, eventually, it should be a final product, but my guess is even, you know, once the Kickstarter is over and they're successful, because I'm sure they will be, um, it's still going to be a very niche product. It's still going to be a very, you know, very expensive, very low production type of thing. And admittedly, even though I'm not exactly an audio person, the 500 and something dollar kit sounded appealing until I realized, yeah, that's like 400 pounds. It's a bit expensive. I mean, but if we're talking about uh, this, uh, what is it shipping with a uh, dual TI bird brown Dax uh, mm -hmm. um, noise floor in this minus 160 dB. It's not bad. 16, 24 bit up to 192 K on your resolution. Mm -hmm. But again, that hundred plus price, I'm, because we are recording right now. Yeah. Thank you, Maddie. You're <laughs> awesome. You're my favorite this week. Um, I'm trying to do my Twitch streamer. Uh, 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 when you get bits or whatever, however that works. I'm not very good at that. Um, it's a HD 404, which has all those gangs of features, and it's like 99 bucks, and it comes in a like built tank case too. Yeah. So uh, I guess you're paying for the form factor and the limited availability. I guess. I, <laughs> If we're gonna sell this to audio files, we need to like it needs to come with like moon rocks or beads or something, and say they give it yeah. magical audio powers. So audio and files a will buy it. PBR. <laughs> Man. Well, what it does it does have going for it? It is it doesn't require a preamp, and mm -hmm. it takes mini mini XLR import. So that that's really cool. And I know the company Archer. Orchard Audio. Mm -hmm. I remember I have I have some device devices with their chipsets in them um, that came from the aerospace industry. So so I, I was like I know this audio company. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, they're they're used to dealing with very expensive products. <laughs> the lowest better. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the Apple Pie deck. It's a thing. It's yeah, a thing. Apple, it's brilliant. Yes. Again, all this is in our show notes before we get out of here. We do take a bit of feedback. If you want to scream in our direction, talk to us, ask a question. You never know. Uh, we like to hear from anyone who is patient enough to get this far in the show. You should get a Steven, Steve, a Steven achievement for it. Yes, a Steven <laughs> achievement. <laughs> uh, you can do that. LinuxTeamCast.com. Tap that contact button. Fill it out. Send it over. We'll get to it. Uh, even doesn't necessarily always have to be about stuff stuff that's on the show leave us a youtube comment that works pedro and i get around to reading those occasionally they are there uh coming up this week what do we got i think we got two little pieces coming yes. in one yes, from arthur yeah he uh this was actually one of his story suggestions but it wasn't really a story it was an interesting bit so here it is uh new manjaro spinoff with the jade desktop environment just another desktop environment 
hence the jade name, made with web technologies mm. slash electron thingy. Another case of just because you can doesn't mean you should. Yeah, we've <laughs> talked about this. Uh, we covered the, a very similar project a while back, or it may even have uh, been the project that then turned into Jade for all I know. Because, yes, this is a desktop environment running on Blink, for all intents and purposes. Mm. <laughs> um, explain that to me like I was paying attention. Uh... <laughs> okay, so you know how your browser can actually do some basic compositing and it can create its own little windows and uh, if you care enough, it can basically run your entire computer like uh, Google did with Chrome OS. Wait, is this well... like some type of like uh, Chrome uh, Chrome OS on hard mode? Is, is that what, what I mean? Almost, yes. <laughs> Without any of the Google support behind it or being able to run Android apps, but it's uh, a complete desktop environment or at least a window manager mm -hmm. or running on web technologies. So if you've ever wanted JavaScript to run your desktop environment, yeah, there you go. <laughs> I was just going to say, it looks like some of the old uh, Sun Java interfaces yep. that were on Live City in the 90s. So, <laughs> hey, you know, I, you, you can blow up Sun all you want, but as somebody who used to spend a lot of time having to install Solaris on like Saber 2 architecture that took four months, they at least yeah. included a web browser in the install. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you could surf. Um, Hey, that's the thing. Technology, maybe you like it. Go check it out. Uh, we were talking last week for a hot second about statistics, you know, just mm -hmm. actual numbers of yeah. Linux. And <laughs> Angel wrote in because we, this is not a gaming show, but, you know, we brought up the Steam survey. Mm -hmm. And as part of that, uh, right, so it's like, guys, 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 uh, do yeah. you really think <laughs> Steam only does telemetry when you get the hardware survey? Get real. They know your platform. <laughs> as soon as you log in, your Steam client, they can measure that stuff. Uh, to which I'll retort, you do realize that two of the people on the show have done the longest running Linux gaming podcast, and um, we, 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 we know that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, Valve is a private company. They basically owe investors nothing. They don't have a public, uh, they don't have stocks that are traded publicly. They answer to no one but, you know, the law enforcement agencies, basically. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, they basically can do whatever they want. And yes, we know that they are very much capable of getting, okay, we have exactly these many Linux users, but they're not doing that. No, the only thing we yeah. were talking about because with they, the Steam surveys, the Steam survey is the public facing, the only numbers mm -hmm. that we can really, is like, who's who's gotten a survey? And we can kind of just talk about yeah. that, like that number. Yeah, they, they don't mean anything. I, I wrote back on the YouTube comments, like, you're 100% right. And yeah. Uh, yeah, Steam surveys are junk. You just, you never, yeah. you, you want to trigger a Steam survey? Install Steam in a wine bottle and then log back yep. into your Linux desktop client and boom surprise survey and they even know when you're running one it's mm -hmm. i don't know i honestly think uh, steam surveys is going to avoid dev null <laughs> it is just there to make you think hey, look we're, we're keeping track of these metrics i don't know and they have to uh, at least have something that's public facing to justify the numbers that they put out if you go to store dot steam dot com forward slash hw survey you get the aggregate numbers that they get from those surveys and we don't really know if those are just the numbers of the people who got the little survey pop-up or if they're actually representative of the entire active steam community we don't know that's the thing we don't know anything about valve's numbers because they're selling that for a heck of a lot of money i'm guessing because we don't know that mm -hmm. for sure either <laughs> I forgot to cut my ringer off on the yeah. um, mobile. It finally went off. I had to mute myself. It's like, hey, you know the new thing about being the Google Voice beta? It makes all your tablets ring again like it used to. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, it's pretty annoying. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I mean, if you're still curious about stats, you can head over to uh, Steam. So, all right. Um, um, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank, thanks, uh, privacy and all that fun stuff. Which is a good thing. We don't know. We don't know. It's a hot mess. Kind of like this show, but we enjoy doing it so much. We'll see you again next week. Uh, come check us out. Uh, Jordan, tomorrow, uh, me, Friday, 
and all of us, the gay, the gang of humanity shall return Saturday night for a big show. And it's going to be a thing. Mm-hmm. Until then, we're going to tap the credits and see what happens. I don't know. Do I get credits? There we go. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> <Hey>, yes. Yay. <laughs> Made it through another one. Uh, yeah, yeah. Another week. Okay. Bunch more analytics it, news. What was it? It must have been shorter than last week. <laughs> um, 55 minutes. <laughs> So, yes, ah, yes okay. it was. So, yes, yes, it was under an hour. Yay. <laughs> yeah, that time I, I, I could tell. <laughs> Thank you, chat room. <laughs> yeah. Also, let us know. Do you like the longer ones or the shorter ones? I mean, this is the midweek thing, so if you like shorter ones, we totally get it. Let's pretend that yeah. anybody has any say in how long these things are. <laughs> Yes, pretend being the operative word. Pretend. We love you. Bye, chat room.